Or Exodus chapter 33, verses 12 through 23. Moses, Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, lead this people forward, but you've not made known to me whom you will send with me. Further, you've said, I have singled you out by name, and you have indeed gained my favor. Now, if I've truly gained your favor, pray let me know your ways, that I may know you and continue in your favor. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, I will go in the lead and will lighten your burden. And he said to him, Unless you go in the lead, don't make us leave this place. For how shall it be known that your people have gained your favor unless you go with us, so that we may be distinguished, your people and I, from every people on the face of the earth? The Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you've asked, for you have truly gained my favor, and I have singled you out by name. He said, oh, let me behold your presence. And he answered, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim before you the name of the Lord and the grace that I grant and the compassion that I show. But, he said, you cannot see my face. For man may not see me and live. And the Lord said, See, there is a place near me. Station yourself on the rock, and as my presence passes by, I'll put you in a cleft of the rock and shield you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away, and you will see my back. But my face must not be seen. Grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord lives forever. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So are we God's people or not? Is God really with us or not? Is God against us? Does God even care? Questions now swirling through Moses' mind, the people of Israel's mind. Obviously, Moses sees God or is talking to God. God, Moses knows God is right there at the moment. But is God really with us? Is God really for us? Now, they were speaking as close to -to face-to-face as as we really get, uh, you know, unless we think about the presence of God being in Jesus and seeing God face to face like that. But this is about as close as, as we get to being face to face with God is how close Moses gets. And it's a mysterious thing because actually if we had read one verse more leading into this passage right before this, uh, it, it talks about how Moses and God were talking to face to face as though one talks to a friend. So it's confusing. But from this part of the passage, we Uh, get the idea that that's not quite as it sounds. Uh, There must be a lot of variations to speaking to God face to face. Uh, But whatever the case, in this situation, Moses being in the middle of the thunderstorm, the fire, and then the the wild stuff going on signifying the presence of God, Moses being in the middle of that still doesn't qualify as seeing God face to face. And Moses is requesting such a meeting face to face. And in the midst of all the power and glory that's instilling fear in the Israelites, uh, God has been talking it up with Moses, giving commandments, instructions, and giving everything to reassure Moses and likewise the people uh, that God was with them, that God had led them, that God was going to continue to lead them, that God had all these instructions to help them be what they were supposed to be as they were already falling short of that, to lead them forward 
as a new people, to remind them what they were doing all the way out there in the desert. For their relationship from this point on, this new beginning, to be built on the solid foundation of God's love for them. Nevertheless, we hit a big old bump in the road before very long. Like the kind of bump in the road, uh, like a huge gaping pothole that gives you a flat tire. Like that kind of bump in the road. Now, in the middle of all these conversations, these close conversations Moses is having with, with, with God, uh, frustration, anxiety, and anger took the, shore, took the shape of a golden calf. People made a golden calf to uh, tell them that God was with them, or they made Aaron do it, whatever. Now, in my mind, their frustrations, anxieties, and anger uh, that caused them to fashion a golden calf and, and sing and dance for it, in my mind, that's not a whole lot uh, unlike our, for our own frustrations, anxieties, and angers these days uh, as we uh, look to things to calm our fears uh, or to reinforce our opinions or whatever. Uh, that look more like Republican elephants or Democratic donkeys or these militias or movements on the streets, tear gas, burning things down, people being injured, people being murdered. So for some reason, we look to all these kinds of things, some maybe some better on a scale or worse on a scale, but we look to all these things uh, for some kind of guidance or what we're supposed to be doing right now instead of the actual presence of God. And looking to these things uh, creates a, a real nasty bump in the road. Especially when we try to compare them to God. Especially when we think God has ordained some of the things that we put together. Uh, the nasty bump in the road that the Israelites hit, they gave Moses and the people a flat tire real quick. Real quick, it halted their progress, and real quick, it changed forever the nature of their relationship with God. They had just come out of Egypt where Pharaoh's heart had hardened so much. You'd think they'd be better than that. And then the golden calf comes up. Now, as for our present behavior in, in this world today... Your guess is as good as mine to how our behavior is impacting our relationship with God. But as for the whole golden calf episode, we know their relationship with God was damaged. Now, I'm picturing right now, I'm thinking about potholes and bumps in the road. I'm picturing a time not too long ago, I was driving down a Michigan highway. And uh, on this highway, now, these days, it's, it's been repaired as of kind of the last few weeks. And I say repaired, not like repaved, but repaired. They filled in some, some spots, but it's still not, not a great road. Uh, as you may already know, Michigan has kind of a re reputation for terrible roads with the rough weather and the more in the circumstances. Well, there's one road, this highway that I, I, I tend to be on, is, uh, it's bumpy in the fast lane. It's treacherous in the slow lane. And I mean, not only uneven, like if you're going highway speeds, like normal highway speeds, you're going up and down like this at parts of the highway. And then also among those big crazy bumps, you find these gargantuan potholes that literally not long ago, maybe a month or two ago, I literally, before they did the repairs, I saw a big tough truck hit one of those potholes, bust a tire, and go swerving out and then slowing down and stopping in the grass and all kicked up all this dust and everything. You know, it looked like it was almost a, a scene of madness. Right? So, uh, you know, when, when, when you hit something like that in the road, or even when you see somebody else hit something like that in the road, uh, it, changed, it, it tends to change something about your relationship with that road. Or even something about your relationship with your car. It just, you know, is this road, is this for me, or is this road against me? Is this road going to help me get where I'm going, or is this road going to stop me in my tracks? Don't know. Create some questions, and you know, as far as my actual behavior chain, you know, I, I was already trying to avoid the slow lane, then I see that, now I avoid it like the plague. I have nothing to do with that slow lane. It's 
before I bust a tire. It changes things when you run into those bumps in the road. Moses and the people of Israel, they, uh, they hit a nasty bump in the road like that when they were traveling with God. That golden calf, you know, it, it brought their journey together to an abrupt halt. Everything had to pause, and God started to reconsider some things as if God began thinking, uh, you know what, trying to go down this road with these people is a bad idea. It's just not going to work. They keep letting these potholes form, and they keep not doing anything about them. We'll never get where we're trying to go together. Now that is the lead up to today's passage. That's like the first half of uh, the chapter, uh, the, the part we didn't read. In between the golden calf episode and what we just read, God was saying, you know what, instead of me personally going with you all, I'm going to send an angel with you. Maybe a little distance from you all will help me to keep from wiping you all out for being so angry at you. <laughs> Now, of course, that's not an exact quote, kind of my version. What that leads us into is where we're at today. Moses pleading and demanding more grace from God, more understanding from God, more compassion than even God wanted to show at that point. Now, obviously, God's love for them never stopped, or else God wouldn't have offered the angel to go with them. God, or God would have just said, all right, I'll go and then I'll wipe you out because I know you're going to make me mad again. Uh, but, you know, we, we know God's grace and understanding and compassion for them seem to be running short. So God just said, go with this angel, you'll be safer. <laughs> now remember where these people came from. They came from Egypt. Remember the heart of Pharaoh, the most hardened heart of all the land. Push come to shove, the people were showing themselves to be no better than Pharaoh as their hearts kept hardening up. If we pause to remember all the trouble that came out of Pharaoh's hardening heart, it's a little scary to even think of all the trouble an entire people with those kinds of hardened hearts can cause. Enough gargantuan potholes for all of us to hit for all of us to get flat tires. To God's proposal of sending them forward from the mountain with an angel, Moses says, no. Again, my version, not an exact quote. I can't do this without you going with us personally. We can't do this without you going with us personally. Why do you think they were making that golden calf in the first place, turning to an image that they made with their own hands, looking and reaching for a sign that you are with them. We need you with us. We need you personally. Just imagine how many more gargantuan potholes we are going to make for ourselves. I will not go. We will not go without you. How am I, how are we supposed to know that we have your favor unless you go with us and lead us in your way so that we may continue in your favor? And then hearkening back to the conversation Moses and God were having last week, Moses reminds God again, these are your people, not my people. I didn't lead them out of anywhere. You led us out of Egypt. We are your people and we need you. As we find in the scripture, God is won over by Moses' argument, by his pleas and by his demands. God's mind has changed. God's like, okay, all right, fair enough. I'll go in the lead, and I will lighten your burden. But Moses, Moses still needs more. Oh, Lord, let me behold your presence. Let me really see you face to face. Like really, not just this cloud and fire stuff. That stuff's hiding your glory so that we can't really see it for all that it is. Let me behold your glory. And to that, God also gives in. Well, kind of, anyway. Well, you, you still can't see my face. 
right? It's too much for you. It's too much goodness for you. It's too much for you to receive in. Over here. Well, come over here. There's a spot in the rock. Put, put, put yourself in the cleft of this rock, and I'll put you in there. I'll cover, cover you with my hand as I pass by to protect you so that you are not destroyed by simply seeing my glory. Once I've passed by, you'll see my back. You'll see what I've done. You'll see my action as it has just happened. And that's the best I can do for you on this one. Being that you do have my favor, and I don't really want you to die. Now that seems to finally do it for Moses. And from, on, from there on, it is decided. God will continue to go with them. God will continue to lead them, to lighten their burdens, to show them throughout their journey that they do have God's favor by God going with them personally. God even went so far to reveal God's own personal glory to Moses. All of God's goodness and the grace and compassion of God's name. God revealed this at least as, as closely as possible without destroying Moses in the process. Those potholes that people have been making out of their frustrations and anxieties and their anger. And then only running into those potholes to make matters worse. Uh, that has done some serious damage to their relationship with God. Yet because of Moses interceding on their behalf, calling God to God's love for them, talking to God about them, about their needs, putting them even above his self, God made the decision to continue along the journey with them. That decision carries down to us. As God said to Moses, God also said to us a long time ago, I will make all my goodness pass before you to proclaim the name of Yahweh, the grace I grant, the compassion I show. I will go before you and lighten your burden. You know, if any of this First Testament stuff seems confusing to us, you know, what exactly does it mean of Moses talking to God face to face? And lots more stuff that can be very confusing. Um, we know that God's goodness did go before the people at that point. Did proclaim God's own righteous and holy name. Did continue on with that trend of grace and compassion for the people. And is a promise that is still living today. Although the Old Testament stuff is confusing, now we also have Jesus to look at, to see all that goodness, all that grace, all that compassion, and to see what it looks like in the form of a human being. As if that weren't enough, God is still showing us all over and over again in our lives today, which we'll see if we're not too caught up with all our little idols and our little potholes to pay attention for God's true presence around us. God is showing us God's goodness every day, and God is leading us in God's goodness every day, very, very personally. Perhaps one more sight of God's goodness, perhaps another sight of God's compassion, perhaps another vision of God's love in this world, no matter how God, upset God might be over our behavior, perhaps another sight of God's love active in this world might inspire us to put in the work that it takes to even out those nasty bumps in the road, to do some repair work on the potholes that we've created with our frustrations and our anxieties and our anger. I don't know, perhaps. So let's watch out for the presence of the Lord among us, the true and real and personal presence of God among us which remains with us just as God has promised, just as God decided to do that day so long ago. And as we're watching for the Lord's presence, how about we also be the Lord's presence, reaching out to the Lord on each other's behalf, putting the other first, thinking about the other beyond ourselves. 
And not simply to fix each other, not just like, oh, this, this person's got a problem, please help them fix it, or, you know, this person's a sinner, please straighten them out. But, uh, but, you know, I mean, asking for God's grace and compassion for the other, as Moses was doing. True grace and compassion and understanding of where we are in these journeys, uh, how we fall to our faults and the troubles that we make. Let us ask for God's grace to be upon the other so that we might all grow together from it. Let us reach out to God asking for grace and compassion as Moses did for the Israelites. And as God is most certainly with us, very personally, may we each be willing to put in the work that it takes to repair our own ways to repair our relationship with God and to make God's way our own.